computer. Hello, Fred Yoff. Thank you so much for making time. This has been, I've been looking forward to this all day. For me, this is a really special oh, moment. To, yeah. uh, Hello, Hello yeah. Daniel. It's really nice to talk to you again. We've had some uh, stimulating conversations in the past, both personally and on, on video. And so I really look forward to that. Great. So I've, I've prepared a couple of questions for you. And um, I always like to give people an opportunity to start a little bit from their story. And your story is so fascinating because um, you started your professional career very successfully as a physicist, a research physicist, right. and worked in a number of really um, well-renowned institutions as a, as a physicist. And then somehow something happened that made you look at life as a planetary process and ecology and biology in much more detail. So I, I would love to take us on a journey, for you to take us on a journey to tell well, what made that change. It's, uh, it's actually a, a long journey and, and I have to try and sort of summarize it. And uh, it all began in the 1960s. This was a period in which I experienced a profound personal transformation. These were my formative years. I was in my 20s. I, uh, you know, I, I graduated uh, in physics in, in, at the University of Vienna in, in 65, and then had my first postdoc appointments. And uh, I was very much influenced by the cultural movements of the 1960s. And looking back now, uh, I can say that uh, there were two main cultural movements, and both of them had to do with an expansion of consciousness, an expansion of consciousness in two different directions, into the spiritual dimension of consciousness and into the social dimension. So uh, in the spiritual dimension, uh, you had a very strong interest in meditation, in Eastern spirituality, in indigenous spirituality, with the books of Castaneda, for example. And this was supported by the arts, by music, by literature. Uh, there was this famous book, A Hundred Years of Solitude, by Garcia Marquez, The Magic Realism. Uh, that, that, that was really very characteristic of the 60s. And of course, there was experimentation with psychedelics. So all of that uh, combined to uh, a very strong expansion of consciousness into the spiritual domain. And then there was the uh, social consciousness raising, as it was called in those days. And that I see uh, essentially as a very broad questioning of authority. So uh, we had the civil rights movement in the United States questioning the authority of whites over blacks. We had the uh, women's movement questioning patriarchal authority, the student movements questioning the authority of teachers and university administrators, the Prague Spring and the Dubček questioning the authority of the Soviet regime, and again, this was supported by the arts, uh, the films of uh, Antonioni, Fellini, Godard, and so on. Theater played a big role, the living theater, uh, for example. So I was very much influenced by all that. And in the 1970s, I first went into the spiritual dimension in my work, um, uh, uh, exploring parallels between modern physics and Eastern spirituality in my first book, The Tao of Physics, published in 1975. And then I went into the social and ecological direction with my second book, The Turning Point, published in 1982, where I explored this paradigm shift that had happened in physics from a mechanistic worldview to a holistic or ecological view. And I explored it in um, various areas uh, and, and examined various issues such as uh, healthcare, 
management, uh, the economy, uh, psycholo psychology and psychotherapy and so on. And somewhere in the late, sometime between the late 70s and early 80s, I realized that all these problems had to do with life. Actually, I realized it under the influence of Gregory Bateson, with whom I spent a lot of time in 1981 and 82, 80, 81, 82. And so I realized that was all- that, Sorry, was that at um, Esalen or where? where yes, yes. Uh, he lived at Esalen and I often went there to, do, to give seminars. And, and so I had long discussions with Bateson. And so uh, I realized that these issues all had to do with living systems, with individual organisms, social systems, and ecosystems. And so uh, my focus shifted from physics to the life sciences, because physics, uh, although it's relevant, but it really can't tell you anything about the essential nature of life. So that's what I became interested in. And then for the next 30 years, I put together a synthesis of an emerging new conception of life in terms of networks, in terms of patterns, in terms of relationships. And already in my book, The Turning Point, I called this the systems view of life. And at the end of this trajectory, is a textbook that I wrote with my friend and colleague, uh, Pierluigi Luisi, a biochemist at the University of Rome. And uh, we called it uh, the system's view of life. And this is, for me, my grand synthesis of this new conception of life, which integrates four dimensions of life. The biological dimension, obviously, but also the cognitive dimension, uh, the social dimension and the ecological dimension. So that's a long trajectory from uh, the 60s when I got my inspiration to the 1970s when, you know, some conceptual framework began to emerge to uh, the 80s where I um, got involved in green politics and, and just went on and on. And having really lived so intimately with some of the, the the pioneers as well i mean you know so many of the the early actors in the environmental movement who really raised awareness about the global situation and these converging crises as, as you've called them yourself um having seen all that because you, what you just said the that in the 1960s and even early 1970s this social change and environmental change movement was very much also accompanied by cultural change, by um, the arts, theater, music, all of that. Right now, there seems to be another upsurge of um, issues or like that, but we, we still haven't reached that broad social movement that includes the arts and, and culture enough. Yeah. And, and having already lived through it 50 years ago, are you hopeful that this time around we, well, we see you it? Know, Daniel, looking back, I, I feel now that uh, social change, uh, of course, does not happen smoothly. Yeah. It's not a, you know, a broad trajectory toward uh, a different uh, society, different economics, different culture. Uh, I came to see it more like a, a pendulum, but not a regular pendulum, a chaotic pendulum. This is something we study in chaos theory. This, this is a pendulum that is highly irregular, unpredictable, and goes back and forth, but never in the same way. And so we had the early inspiration, the change of awareness in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, we had the political manifestation in green politics and in the 1980s. And I believed uh, toward the end of the 1980s that we were now ready to embrace this new vision of reality and embody it politically and really change the world. 
Well, what happened then was something totally unforeseen, which nobody had predicted, and that was the information technology revolution, which led, among many other things, to a new, um, a new materialism, really, and, uh, a, of course, a new global economy, which was dominated uh, by, and was and is dominated by corporations, and um, brought with it uh, materialism and greed very much uh, the opposite of the values we had developed in the 60s and 70s. And it took us a whole decade, the decade of the 90s, to, to really deal with that because globalization, that was the, the, the sort of umbrella term, um, is not only economic globalization, corporate economic globalization, but also cultural globalization. You and I today, we, we and, and even more so younger people, uh, live in, in a, a networked world, in a globally networked world. And so uh, we were very excited about that, but the shadow side uh, is the, the corporate economy, which is uh, you know, geared toward exploitation and toward shifting wealth from, uh, you know, as the Occupy movement said, the 99% to, to the 1%. So uh, in 1999, there was the uh, meeting of the WTO, the World Trade Organization in Seattle, where a new global civil society emerged and and so now we have two main forces we have the corporate world the corporate economy and we have the global civil society and they are on a collision course and and uh, the crisis that i described and foresaw in the turning point in in the late 70s uh, has now intensified and of course it has been exacerbated by uh, climate change, really climate breakdown, which we also foresaw. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I wrote about climate change or global warming as, as it was called then in 1988. So mm -hmm. that's, that's a long time ago. But, and of course, we could have alleviated it much easier than we can now. So there is, uh, there is a sharp crisis. Well, am I hopeful? Uh, I am hopeful, yes, but in a particular sense. Mm -hmm. I have been very much inspired by Václav Havel. I met Havel in 1997 when he invited me to a symposium called uh, Forum 2000. And I was, I've been very much inspired by something he wrote when he was a dissident and was actually in prison. And it is a meditation on hope where Havel sees hope, as he says, as a dimension of the soul and not as the result of an assessment of the situation in the world. Let me read to you what, what he writes. Hope is not the conviction that something will turn out well, but the certainty that something makes sense, regardless of how it turns out. Mm -hmm. And so I've tried to live like that. I've been very inspired by that. Yeah, no, that's so true. It really rings true. The, the, how do you see? I mean, you, you rightly spoke to the, the, the many faceted dimensions of that globalization process, that neoliberal globalization that took took hold of us in the 1990s. Um, one of them is, is like a globalization or colonialization of the mind, which has been going on for a long time. It's a, it's a, and we, we need to re-educate and begin to see the world from a system's pu uh, view of life. Um, and there's still so few institutions in the world that actually really focus on that education that is now so needed. I mean, you, you co-founded the Center for Ecoliteracy and, and spent a long time actually looking at how, how do we start um, through education to create this mind shift. Um, and we first met at Schumacher College in 2001. And I would love to take to take this opportunity for you to say a little bit about you've had a relationship with Schumacher since the beginning, and why do you think? Because in those days, that was the only place you you taught regularly. Yes. Um, and 
could you say a little bit more about what you well, so appreciate first, about the college? Yeah, first let me say that it is true that uh, uh, systems thinking and the, the ecological values, the values of deep ecology, which are essentially spiritual values, all that, all that is not in the mainstream. Mm -hmm. However, it is very broadly embraced in the global civil society, which is very powerful. And it has hundreds and hundreds of NGOs with their research institutes and centers of learning uh, where this thinking is, is developed and practiced. And Schumacher College uh, for the last, uh, what is it, 30, 40 years has been at the forefront. It is a very unique uh, center of uh, transformative learning, learning where you not only absorb ideas and information, but where you're really transformed in, in uh, your, your very uh, nature. And uh, this, it, as you know, it was fa founded by our friend and mentor Satish Kumar, um, who uh, thought, and I, I discussed this with him uh, several times, that this transformative learning would best take place in community, in a locally rooted community, although rooted there only for a short time. Mm -hmm. But he has been able to create a very strong sense of community where people from all over the world take short courses of two or three weeks and not only learn together, but also live together and work together, run the college in terms of cooking, cleaning, gardening, and so on. And so while they're doing this, they talk. They talk around the clock. They, they, they discuss things in the lectures in the morning, and then they talk while they're cutting vegetables, they talk while they're uh, preparing rooms for special events, and they end up late, late at night, you know, talking uh, in the bar, you know, tasting Scottish uh, single malt whiskey. You know? the edge of chaos. Yes. The name of the bar. <laughs> and and so, so this creates a very strong sense of community. And in particular, uh, in my courses, when the subject of learning is patterns of relationships, because that's what systems thinking is all about. Mm -hmm. And when you experience patterns of human relationships at the same time, that's, that's very powerful. And so that's why I think Schumacher College is so unique. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, I'm a testimony for it because basically it was your work and um, to some extent Joanna Macy's work and John Seed's work that first made me aware of the college and that made me want to go there because I found out that all, all three of you were occasionally teaching there and then being there for 18 months in between 2001 and 2003 really did exactly what you just described to transform my life they have, they have these longer courses also the msc programs and that's what you took right yeah exactly i was on on the masters in holistic science and the in the fourth year of it running um and then i stayed on as a helper and part of the com college community for another half year after the course yeah but since since so much has moved on, even then, like I mean, I think Satish is absolutely right. The most transformative, experiential, embodied learning experience happens in community. I mean, even the Buddha said that one of yeah. the columns yeah. of, of Buddhism is the Sangha, the community. Yeah. But but now these these days, um, because we're such a globally interconnected um, human community around the planet. Um, Online learning is something that while at the beginning we might have looked at it uh, not as ideal and not as powerful as face-to-face -face learning, we've realized that it can do wonderful things. And you yourself have set up a wonderful online course that I've also had the pleasure now to take twice already, um, right. the, the, the Fritz Jeff Capra course. And I also yeah. think you've, you've created a really nice schedule for it, but not only has it been a very well-received course, you have grown it into a community of global graduates from that right. course. That's, and I find that really right. interesting. Can you tell a little so, bit about that story? So the, the subject of my course, uh, which is called, you know, officially, uh, you know, the systems view of life, 
but for PR purposes, Capra course, because it's easy to remember. And it has a website, capracourse.net. And so uh, it is based on the textbook that I wrote with Luigi, mm -hmm. The Four Dimensions of the uh, Systems View of Life, Integrating the Biological, the Cognitive, the Social, and the Ecological. And uh, it uh, consists of 12 pre recorded lectures of about 40 minutes. And uh, they were recorded for some reason in uh, Brazil in uh, the home of an architect, a beautiful living room with a very small um, group of uh, participants. And I can tell you, I don't know whether you realize this uh, watching the lectures, that uh, this is really modeled after Schumacher College. Because when you see people sitting on the floor and on couches in this sort of intimate environment uh, discussing things, that's what I've done with people at Chumar College for 20 years. And so I modeled my lectures after that. And in addition to the lectures, there is a discussion forum, an online discussion forum, where people post comments and questions, and I participate in that during the whole course. So for 12 weeks, one lecture a week, uh, I'm there every day for about half an hour to an hour answering questions. And, and that has been a real experience for me because um, although uh, I don't have the face-to-face -face contact with people uh, that I have in a classroom, the conversations and the discussions are much more substantial because in a classroom, when you teach in a classroom and somebody asks you a question, you have to say something, you have to answer. Whether you know an answer or not, you have to say something. Online, that's not true. I can go away and do some research. I can look at books, I can, I can browse the internet, I can think about it. And usually what I do in the morning when I brush my teeth during the course mm -hmm. and, and shave, I think about, I, I check the questions first when I get up and then I think about it and mull them over and then I go and, and discuss things with my students. So uh, as you mentioned, um, the course has now run for four years. We have uh, 1300 more or less alumni around the world in almost, I think in 70 countries now on all continents. Mm -hmm. And even in a single course, uh, the, you know, the next course is starting on let me see, the 26th of February, I have these postcards. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have over 100 registrations now for the 26th of February mm -hmm. from uh, about 30 countries around the world, from all continents. So like at Schumacher College, it's this multicultural, you know, global community. And uh, we have so many alumni now that we have alumni meetings on Zoom, like you and I have right now, but also um, face to face, because uh, whenever I travel somewhere, uh, I, uh, I meet alumni, whether I go to Italy or to Austria or to London or to Sweden, I have alumni meetings and, and I don't need to be there. They have alumni meetings in, in Rio de Janeiro and in, in Buenos Aires and, and various places around the world. So. I'm really realizing my dream here to grow a global community, a global network of systemic thinkers and activists. Mm -hmm. And it's very fulfilling to me. It's, for me, this is so wonderful. I'm, 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 I'm going to, in a minute, stop this and then we, we go into the second part. Um, but one thing that I learned from our common friend, Brian Goodwin, while at Schumacher College, is that you can't really predict and control complex dynamic systems. But the one way of influencing emergence in a way that it is more likely to be positive properties that emerge rather than negative ones is to pay attention to who's connected to whom in the system and what the, the quality of the connections and also what information flows in the system and the quality of the information. And what I hear you doing with this course is actually building a network of global systems thinkers that, that are Im imbued and understand the system's view of life because they had the privilege of learning directly from you and, and then engaging them with each other 
and so much beautiful things can happen from that. So yeah, and also it it uh, underlying it all is a a system of shared values and a certain uh, spiritual attitude which is uh, implicit. And this is also something I learned from Satish Kumar uh, at Schumacher College. Uh, Satish, who is a spiritual teacher, does not push uh, Jainism or Hinduism or, or any religion. He doesn't even push meditation. You know, when he comes to the college, as you will remember, what he does, he goes to the kitchen and he cooks with students. So, so it's a, it's a, in fact, a Gandhian type of spirituality. Mm -hmm. and, and so in the Capra course also, there's a very strong connection, which I think is partly, you know, it's an emotional and partly spiritual connection. Yeah, no, I, I completely agree. I mean, actually, Satish himself gave me this beautiful image of saying, it doesn't really matter. You can, um, ecology, like the ecological view of life, the systems view of life, and spirituality are really um, sides of the same coin. Uh, you can go in into the door of spirituality, and if you really go deep about interbeing and interconnection with life, you end up learning about ecology. And the other option is you go in as a scientist and you go deep into ecology and the systemic interconnection in a complex dynamic system that is constantly transforming. And suddenly you have insights that are deeply spiritual insights and, and you end up in spiritual. Well, of course, you know, as a systems thinker, uh, I would say since everything is interconnected, it doesn't matter where you start. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Wonderful. Let's stop here and then we just immediately go for the, for the next. All right. Thank you.